So for those who don't know, um, hi, I'm Brooks. Um, I run the Delusive Guitar Quarantine Collective. We started during the quarantine. We read. Uh, we started out by reading uh, three times a week. We read as much as we could of Anti-Oedipus, um, and that's kind of what we're known for. But we're on our third reading, and we just started um, section 3.1 and 3.2. We made our way through 3.1, which is um, where they take Desiring Production and go through a universal history and go all the way back to sort of, you know, what makes production happen? How does production organize? And it goes right into poli sci or ethnology or <clears throat> like it's, it's a hundred percent up your alley, but we could totally do 3.1. I just, I just went over all of this. I picked up an extraordinary number of books from some of the authors. They talk about maybe too many, maybe too many. The inscribing socius. The inscribing socius. Uh, we could start very much. Uh, it's the it. idea of how, how the social works. Um, there are things that we have to kind of uh, sort of preface uh, when we go into this because um, I don't like jumping around this book, but I think this book it's more possible if there's a reason. For example, we've never done it, won't do in a thousand plateaus reading uh, because I don't believe mill plateau uh, should be read by a person reading to you. It's intended to be a uh, journey for yourself or open-ended. So, uh, Anti-Oedipus, not so much. Anti-Oedipus is much more of a, I don't want to say traditional textbook because it is fucking not traditional at all, but it is, uh, built very specifically. Uh, the way that they go about it is they start out with their new build of how things probably work their ontology of of things and they talk about desire and it's a rebuilding of desire um this is important i promise because it's the whole thing here um when we talk about desire i can send you a better pdf if yeah you please i think i already have one that you sent me i'm just i had and the other have, one as well i have <clears throat> many many of these give me one moment no i guarantee you've already sent me the good one and i just i have the old one still and i haven't got, yeah I'm, there we go there we go that's good i think i think Let's, uh, you're going to, it's, it's still, it's still like a spread, right? Like it's on two sides. Uh, no, no. Okay. Well then I don't know. Here. What the hell did it? Oh, here we go. I think I got it. I sent it over to you. Oh, did you? Um, I'll keep, I'll keep chatting a little bit during this. Um, I can also share if you want to do that. I can do that too. Um, um, when we talk about desire, when Freud, this is in French, came up, I sent you the French one? Yeah. Oh, I did send you now. I'm sorry. Apologies. I have that one open. You should be send, sending me a French document. That's like a universal um, universal sign of hostility. Yeah, this is 22. One second. I just need to get the right version. There it is. I think this one will do it. Apologies. Um, I have the French one up whenever, uh, because I've... One of our projects is we're retranslating the book, so. I'm oh, so yeah, I do have this one. There we go. So that's good. I, I just, um, I, yeah, I just couldn't find it originally. Good. So, um, when Freud conceptualized desire, one of the, the, which is like his thing, the way that we talk about labor now didn't really exist before, like Ricardo Marx and a handful of others really did their work and sort of helped us understand that there is these other elements that aren't really abstract, but that are material elements of how the social world works. Uh, labor being one of them. It's not that we have this abstract value of labor. It's that labor as a force is really driving things, especially when we talk about how the material conditions of the world become generated and built, blah, blah, blah. Marx, 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 go read Marx. Freud, uh, began sort of playing in a lot of the same spaces and talking about, well, uh, the great social, you do that, you do the society thing, the political thing, but I, I want to talk about people's desire internally, what's driving people. He started pushing this idea about desire and for desire for him, uh, was not so much that I want something, but instead this, uh, force of desire. Uh, he called it libido and, uh, D and G run with this, this pre-personal, pre-conscious, unconscious drive and push a, v a system of vitality or energy. There's a million ways this gets translated or played with now, but it's this idea of this pre-personal. So when we talk about desire in this section and throughout this book, we are not talking about uh, desire as built by capitalism where I want a car because I saw an ad or I need a new computer. Mm, that's way down the road. That, that conceptualization of desire is 
post-personal, it's social, it's socially set. We need to talk about desire internally. What are the drives that are creating all of the parts? What are the things that are connecting, disconnecting, recording? What is the process that emergently from the core of desire, not from us, but from desire itself, how does the society build itself? So when we start talking about uh, how society works and desire, we're starting at that point. We're talking about a non-personalized desire, a non-human desire. We're talking about that, that version of it. So when we open here, um, they have spent, and you're, you're going to be lost. Anyone listening who hasn't read this, you're going to be fully lost. We're going to talk through all of it. Don't worry. I'm, I do this. This is my jam. I love this. I this don't. Like, I'm as lost as you. I, I, I adore this. We will talk about literally every question Sunday has or other people have because uh, this, is, this is the shit I love doing. And, uh, and hopefully I make a little bit of sense by the end of it. So when we're talking and when we're building, we want to talk not just about uh, uh, desire. There's a second half. It's really important. Apologies. Um, and I'm just going to go with this as rote because they've spent a lot of time sort of proving out and talking through it. Um, one of the big things to remember is that repression is not something that's internal to us, that we like to be thinking about the idea of this individual, oh, if only I could get over my own personal problem, I could be a great person. If only I could get past my own stumbling blocks, my own issues. Uh, speaking of which, Brooks, your microphone has once again drifted a little bit away from your face. There you go. I'm sorry about this. I'll do what I can to keep it up. Um, is that a little bit better? That's, that's spectacular. Thank you. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> wouldn't we talk about uh, repression on the other side. So there's desire, this vital force up, and then there's repression, the force down. Repression comes socially. Repression first comes social, then personal. It is not that one needs to work on themselves and then the rest of society. It is that the rest of society and the social world is repressive on the individual organism, on desire. This is important. I'm not going to argue these things. But this is kind of a big deal. That The social is the big deal. So with that, we'll jump into 3.1 and we'll make our way, uh, we'll make our way in. I promise I'll do what I can here. Okay, Sunday. So at any point, Sunday, don't hesitate to stop me. We will discuss. We can go over points. I will describe and, and answer what I can. We'll do our shit. Cool. All right. Let's do it. The inscribing socius. If the universal comes at the end the body without organs and desiring production, under the conditions determined by an apparently victorious capitalism, where do we find enough innocence for generating universal history? We will go over this whole sentence, don't yeah. worry. <laughs> we will get back to it. Desiring production also exists from the beginning. There is desiring production from the moment there is social production and reproduction. But in a very precise sense, it is true that pre-capitalist social machines are inherent in desire. They code it. They code the flow of desire. To code desire and the fear, the anguish of decoded flows, is the business of the socius. As we shall see, capitalism is the only social machine that is constructed on the basis of decoded flows, substituting for intrinsic codes, an axiomatic of abstract quantities in the form of money. We will get to that too. Capitalism, it's, this book is wonderful. Don't worry. Cap, I, I will be able to explain all this. We're good. Capitalism therefore liberates the flows of desire, but under the social conditions that define its limit and the possibility of its own dissolution, so that it is constantly opposing with all its exasperated strength the movement that drives it toward this limit. At capitalism's limit, the deterritorialized socius gives way to the body without organs and the decoded flows throw themselves into desiring productions. Hence, it is correct to retrospectively understand all history in the light of capitalism, provided that the rules formulated by Marx are followed exactly. And the last Marx line we'll get to later, he, he goes through the multiple rules. He's a Deleuze is like a hardcore Marxist. But to talk about sort of this opening. Oh, I know. I know, Sunday. I, I'm, I'm in, I, even have, I don't even see you. I'm I can glad feel you know. your face. I can feel <clears throat> your face right now. Um, there's a lot that's being said here. There's a fuck ton that's being said here. But it's actually a lot simpler at the base. If I were to have to sum up all of this, I would say simply, capitalism, unlike other social systems, uh, 
abrogates itself, uh, creates itself, builds on itself, rules disconnected from any actual causal demand. There's no codification because of where we must be. Instead, it's you ought, we should do this, do that. You ought to be this kind of person. You ought to behave this way. Rules, they call them axiomatics. They call them uh, 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 ways that desire gets sort of set up. In, in older societies, they, they had codification of things. The, the social codes, this is a classic ethnology, classic sort of um, uh, anthropology. When uh, people had desire, as the way they're talking about, when people wanted to do things, they did or they didn't, based on hardline social codes. Codes that were, you hunted because we need hunters. You did this because we needed this. You did this because the tribes could survive this way. You did this because of a dictator saying yes or no. Hardline rules with death and harm and specific specificity around it. Capital and capitalism doesn't have that. We don't have the same rules. We have rules, but they aren't things that we experience or grow into. They are those put upon us that actually have no reality outside of themselves. There's no material reality to them. Instead, we have all of these desires restrained by axiomatics rules given to us. Even breaking it down, like explain like I'm five version. I've got a six year old in the, in the world of the kitchen. We have a rule that we don't play around in the kitchen. Why, why don't we play around in the kitchen? Because dad's cooking and there's hot stuff. You can burn yourself. You can cut yourself and all kinds of things. That rule, is for very particular immediate understanding that setup. Other another rule, you have to finish all the food on your plate. Why? Like really why? Like what's the reason for that? Like what's the what's the drive there? What's the thing that's causing that? Um, you're free to tell me. Like I'm asking. Yeah, yeah well, because 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 like the, the the child will will pick out food that they like and ignore food that they don't like, and they'll be malnourished if they don't. Really. I don't know. That, that would be the. I mean, that's a that's a pretty decent reason. That seems like it's a little heady, rather than don't touch stove because you'll burn yourself or, right? Like it's the yeah. the rules aren't 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 coded the same way. Rules in our world are are given to us. They're handed out <clears throat> as axiomatic sort of uh, tautologies instead of driving desire. They they restrain it and they do it in a really unique way. And this is what they're sort of talking about is here we are at capitalism. Capitalism is a unique time and place because we don't have hardline codes on desire. We don't have these rules where uh, things are directly imminent to us. Uh, you know, and they'll be going through this at one point. Uh, a hunter, for example, would never hunt and then eat his own kill. Uh, that's, that's insane. They would never do that in any tribe ever because they'd be fucking thrown out. They'd be fucking killed maybe because hunters don't do that. Hunters hunt. They bring it back. Person cooks. There's everyone's got their jobs and it's because if they don't do that, they die. Like as a group, yeah. they need, they need this to survive. That immediacy follows through a dictatorships and a different setup pretty well. But in our world, because the economic system works as it does, rules are very much image-based and sort of built around uh, these different setups uh, socially. So they don't work in the same way. But because they don't work in the same way, and this is where they're talking about how do we find innocence for generating a universal history? How do we talk about history? And it's because we actually are freed from that. They, they don't have a, there's no noble savage bullshit happening here they're very upfront that the the brutality and the the outright horrifying nature of like the power struggles that existed and the struggle for life and death that we don't have anymore in the same way there may be people in the world that do but capitalism handles it handles even that very differently because of that we actually can sort of step back and start talking about how the socius may operate uh because as they say capitalism is the only social machine constructed on the basis of decoding flows. It breaks down, it decodes uh, flows of desire. It's um, the breakdown of, as Marx would talk about it, the breakdown of anything, the contradictions over time within any system. A gender, for example, the breakdown of the nuclear family, the breakdown of uh, the church or hardline narratives, uh, these things that have happened over time, this decoding of things. This is what capitalism does, is the nature of capitalism. And because of that, 
because of this odd swap that happens, it actually gives us a completely different chance to look at how those codes worked. We're able to see them a lot more clearly. For example, if you were to go back 400 years and actually offer up the idea of gender studies, probably wouldn't go over so well because yeah. that's, that, that's not how it worked. You had very particularized hardcore rules in a lot of ways. These things have broken down. When things break down, we get to recognize them and we get to work through them. This would be the way this works. Because it permits, this is, us, this is, it permits us to survive their breakdown in a much more casual sense, I suppose. No, I mean that's that's this is classic Marx. Like this is this is like one of the central themes of Das Kapital. As things break down, it isn't that the breakdown is necessarily bad. It's yeah. not that the breakdown is the shattering of it. It's that as we do that, we're able to see the thing for the first time. Only when something breaks are we able to therefore see it. Right, I see. Okay. Oh, I see. So it's okay, got it, got it. So it's not that it's not that capitalism sort of affords us the ability to view the breakdown. Rather, it causes the breakdown and provides the breakdown itself. So I was thinking of it more in terms of it gives you like, and probably it also does that too, but it gives you like the the, the uh, peculiar le leisure and luxury of being able to observe this thing without being sort of enmeshed in it such like the hunter hunting. Da, da, da. The it's codes like of that. things yeah. under capital begin to to decode. They, they fall apart. They're replaced by these rules, but because they fall apart, we're able to then go back and think of everything in sort of this universalized history they're going to be talking about where we look at how desire was manipulated, how codification worked, how codification changed, and ultimately how we got to this place where we're at, which is a place of decoded flows, but still with a brutal power structure backing it. And this is, again, uh, part of the thing they're going to be getting in through the rest of it. That's the basis of this is okay. we're we're in a privileged place that we're able to look back and go, Hey, this is cool. We've got some shit, shit happening. Let's take a look. Right. All right. Um, does that make sense so far? That makes, I think that makes sense. That's the catch. Um, I think, I think it might be helpful for the sake of clarity. If you wanted to very quickly, just give a, give a brief, to the extent that you can run down mm -hmm. on the body without organs. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to use my video game analogy because I think I know your audience pretty well. Okay. Um, if you've ever played a large scale multiplayer game, World of Warcraft would be an example. League of Legends and Dota are Dota's mine. Um, uh, the the way that uh, these games exist is they aren't built up front with a what's the best way to play. Instead, day one, they're released, the rules are out there, it's complex, the, the way people interplay is very complex. So think of all of the players as sort of the baselines of desires. They connect, they play, they disconnect, and a thing is recorded. It's not really that we sit and write something down, but that a recording is made as part of production. The recording is the result, the, the sensation, the win-loss ratio, you might say. In mass, at large, over time, games get a meta uh diablo has this happen any game that kind of has these really you know particularized and hyper mathematical structures tends to get pretty brutal about it one gun works better than others uh, counter-strike for example has a meta that very rarely changes to be perfectly frank the way that uh that meta shows up and the way that meta then tells other people how to behave when people join the game this character is a support in Dota. This character has these items in Dota. Um, the, these, these, these setups and these things aren't in the game. In fact, there's nowhere these rules are written, but the meta says so. The meta as a thing exists emergently, but only exists as the shape of things, but it doesn't exist anywhere. The body without organs, which we each exist with, is the same thing. The way that you live and way you exist, the reality of your entire body existing from the moment of birth until now, you only have decided where the edges of your bodies are, where your fingertips are, how you feel when you're hungry, what hunger is, what it means for you to talk, why you talk, what I means when you say it, what your stream means. Everything you say, your, your meta, your personal meta is your body without organs. It is your body 
without anything productive connected to it. It is what is produced, the leavings, the droppings of the recordings of everything. Everything has this. There's a, there's a, there's a body without organs to an extraordinary number of things uh, because it's everything that produces, produces. <clears throat> and over time, the body shows up. That body takes claim. You, you claim ownership of your body. You don't have ownership. No one does in any meaningful sense at all. Just like no one owns the meta of a game. No one created it. No one sets it up. But the meta determines. You determine. So when we have our, the words around here we're talking with, when we're talking about our body without organs, we're talking about that thing at large. Now, the social machines, and they call it out and they pull it out separately, is a really unique version of this. Because it's the meta for all for everything. It's the edges of everything we know. There is nothing beyond it until we get there. Then it finds something beyond it, especially in capitalism. That is a unique BWO. In fact, so unique, they call it the socius, the, the large, massive social machine that is that giant body of all of us that falls back on all of us as well. That's a really cool That's analogy. I, when did you think of that? Is that uh, a couple two years ago? Okay. I think I used it the first time. Did you? And I just okay, I probably didn't click the first time. That's 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 a really I don't, I don't even know if I've it. used it on your stream. It's it's Maybe it's not. a perfect version of it because um, it, it, people get metas and they understand how at some point they I got bored because of the meta uh, I, I hate the meta because everyone who joins they always play with Broodmother and Broodmother now has a fucking heart of Tarask. God damn it. And it's like nowhere is it written ever in the game like these are the items you need but at large this is what people tend to do because this is the most efficient thing uh, which is literally how capitalism works capitalism loves efficiency capitalism loves metas it, it digs the shit out of that because it is the greatest version of that and so when they use terms like for example the deterritorialized socius that these are grand terms they're being particular with them because what they want us to be thinking about is thinking about the surface of everything, not abstractly, but materially. Think of everything as a gigantic surface where everything is constantly being written. Uh, and by written, it is the stream that you're on, the people watching, me talking, everything, the recordings of all of it are constantly being written. The meta of it all is constantly there. This is this is the point because at some point the meta of things sets us up the meta of things puts us in the position the meta of everything tells us what we ought to be doing and we don't even really know why we're doing it hmm mm -hmm. uh what immediately sort of comes to mind and maybe this is like a, a more boring way to to explain it, maybe it's just to confirm that i'm following you a little bit it, it mm -hmm. brought to mind um john locke's notion of how property works and his, his reasonings for what is an appropriate as opposed to an inappropriate amount of, of, I guess, owned stuff to count as one's property. And the distinction is, if one is able to productively use what one owns, that's his property in like a strong sense. That's like an extension of his body. Mm -hmm. um, if one isn't capable of using it, if like, for example, he has like tons of resources that just rot in a barn somewhere because he just can't possibly make use of it or profit from it or whatever, that's that's not and so it's not appropriate to refer to that as as something that he owns that's something else and so the body without organs in this case would be the concept of that that person's self which extends over through it the activity with like this stuff in the world da, 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 da. and it's that all, idea all, all things more or less yeah 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 all, all that'd things. be like an and, instance and, of it yeah yeah it's, it's it'd be all the things it it uh it would be even more so than that, that when people talk about my business or I built this or I make these things, I, I, I build video games. I don't build video games. My company builds video games. I happen to like the, mm. the, I and the setup, the, the, the thing I'm falling back on the production. I fall back on the production it, call out marks. Hey, capitalists take credit for production, even though they're what's produced by production. How weird is that? Well, let's just ask, why is that where we draw the line? Why don't we do that with ourselves as well? Because our bodies produce all the things they produce. And I have some level of control. I like to think of when I shit and piss and fuck and come and, and spit and eat. But the reality is I only have control. The body at large is an incredibly complex organism that's doing all these things. But at the end, I get to claim ownership. 
and I am the capitalist of my own body. Okay. Just not on my stream or not. We're still under YouTube's Zato OTA. Fair enough. Yes. But, uh, okay. Okay. No, I, that's, I think, I think we're on the same page. Um, awesome. chat, that's your problem if you're not on the same page. Uh, I mean, they're not, the, they're not far off. Uh, the, the, the discussion and the thing they're pointing out, and again, yeah. uh, it's just the introductory paragraph. We're going to be going through a lot of Marx's stuff. So if you haven't polished up your Marx lately, please do. Um, as I like to say, Marx, uh, Deleuze is like the most Marxist Marxist that there is. That angers a lot of people, but I think it's accurate. Um, uh, and uh, Road Squatch says to kick Beardy off hundred dollars. Well, no, I'd, I'd be happy to not do this. So feel free to spend that money, Beardy. <laughs> I have no desire to have you do what you're doing. So you're fine. Trust me. I'd I'd leave in a heartbeat. Um. All right. <laughs> okay. Give 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 Professor give 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 Press Sunday money, and he'll kick me off. Otherwise, I'm going to move to the next paragraph. Oh, if he, if he gives me a hundred dollars, we'll, we'll just we'll just do this off stream. Um, let's keep going. Oh, there we go. First of all, universal history is the history of contingencies and not the history of necessity. Ruptures and limits and not continuity. For great accidents were necessary and amazing encounters that could have happened elsewhere or before or might never have happened in order for the flows to escape coding and escaping to nonetheless fashion a new machine bearing the determinations of the capitalist socius. Thus, the encounter between private property and commodity production, which presents itself, however, as two quite distinct forms of decoding, by privatization and by abstraction, or from the viewpoint of private property itself, the encounter between flows of convertible wealth owned by capitalists and a flow of workers possessing nothing more than their labor capacity. Here again, two distinct forms of deterritorialization, in a sense, capitalism has haunted all forms of society, but it haunts them as their terrifying nightmare. It is the dread they feel of a flow that would elude their codes. Then again, if we say that capitalism determines the conditions and the possibility of a universal history, this is true only insofar as capitalism has to deal essentially with its own limit, its own destruction. As Marx says, insofar as it is capable of self-criticism, at least to a certain point, the point where the limit appears and the very movement that counteracts the tendency. In a word, universal history is not only retrospective, it is also contingent, singular, ironic, and critical. Explain that word ironic here. Uh -oh. uh, uh, there's an edge of uh, 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 poetry and non-direct meaning. Uh, the, the word used in the French, give me two seconds to find the passage in French. It's easier for me to do that. By the way, while you're looking, uh, thank you, Queen Soul, for the $5. I'm giving money to keep Based McBeard Man on. I'm calling you that now, by the way. Based McBeard Man, I'll, I'll take that. That's not, that's not terrible. I've, I've been called much fucking worse, for sure. Um, oh, this is one of those. They do this in the English version. It's very frustrating where they take like three paragraphs and then they go yeah who needs who need it's actually one giant paragraph they break it into three paragraphs because why would we care about where <laughs> where they end and and begin oh yeah Appar apparently this translation guy is the only one you can really get in english as far as i'm aware is terrible <laughs> it is uh it is passing at best well you you sh I, I, you showed me a couple things and they were these weren't just like loose translations these were absolutely misleading because they got the metaphor wrong like the um yeah what was it the folding versus the what was the other thing the the was it folding versus turning i think flux versus flow flux is versus the worst. flow flux versus flow is the worst to where i've i spent like i spent two years writing and reading on it because in all english works people use the word flow because that's what it was translated as in all of Deleuze's works flux was translated as flow Except he uses different words for culé, uh, which is to flow like a flowing river, and flux, which is like an afflux, a, an explosion, like um, a, uh, a reflux. Like it's intended, yeah, it's yeah. a different thing. It's a rate of change within a moment. It's a different intention because it comes from Bergson, and it's just been very frustrating. Um, uh, no, they use ironic in the original too. Um, 
So when we talk about uh, the iron, well, I, it's easier, I think, if we start from the beginning because then it will. Sure. We'll start from the beginning Let's of the it. paragraph. Um, the biggest thing, and uh, again, uh, the. There's no such thing as narratives. If, if there is a thing Marx slowly tore apart and really, really wanted us to understand is that history is material and contingent. It is not about the necessity of things. Oh, the reason that America is as great as it is because uh, the world was just waiting for an America to come along and necessarily somewhere had to be it. So it might as well be America. America had to be it. Uh, Greece, that had to be the place where where philosophy happened because it had to happen somewhere. That it, it throws out the contingent sort of understanding of why, with all these things coming together, why things happen. And they want us to start with that first off. Marx, Marx would say the same thing, and I cannot tell you how often I fucking get upset at people. Uh, Marx's big thing, no. Uh, it's a history of ruptures and limits, not continuity. Ruptures and limits, the, the phrasing around this is breaks in things the ruptures yeah. and limits it's the shattering it's the stifling it's the repression it is not a single big continuity so even though they're talking about universal history and they're drawing a continuous line thus the ironic component um it is not actually a history of continuity it's about understanding that these things break shatter find pieces from other things that are broken add them to the pile and new thing is made uh, for great accidents were necessary. Amazing encounters that may have happened elsewhere before or after, blah, blah, blah. They had, again, the same thing, saying uh, this shit could have happened anywhere. Why here? Why contingent? Why this? Going through and understanding all of the drives, all of the parts, all of the pieces. This is their big push underneath it. So that's like a big deal to them. Um, they, they want us to understand that. They give a handful of really great examples because... Again, when we talk about coding, with capitalism there, capitalism decoding, taking the, the rules, the imminent, absolute, total rules of existence that people live with and social uh, codes sort of have built on. You go to old tribes. Um, I've been reading a lot of uh, uh, Delier um, and Mouse and um, Levi Strauss. Uh, go back through and read any of those. The tribes throughout history, uh, everywhere, kind of were built on the same thing, these hardline codes that were specific to the point of being carved into bodies. And you went through a, a ritual, uh, not only where you were carved upon or tattooed or went through a pain ritual or scarification or much worse in a, in a lot of places, but also that everyone watched because it was important for people to see this pain. It was important for people, the codification is a big deal and desires that escape coding were horrifying. They were horrifying. There, there are stories written about it. You couldn't have things that society didn't account for. And here's capitalism breaking it down and having shit society doesn't account for because it doesn't yeah. give a fuck. It's economic. It's not power structure. It's, 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 it's not codified. It's a completely different thing. And so the examples they give, uh, I love. It's the encounter between private property and commodity production, which is two different forms of decoding. Uh, privatization and abstraction. Commodity production is an abstraction form. Uh, and then privatization, the privatization of private property. This feels like two completely different things, the idea of private property. But the decoding of them, the, the shifting away from what their specific use is in time, which is what they're talking about here. Again, the idea of private property thousand years ago is not what we talk about today. It's not the same thing, even remotely, as you were just talking about yeah. with... Um, with Locke, like even he would be completely confused uh, with how we talk about private property. So these, these things uh, and how they sort of operate and how they sort of play, it's completely different. And it's because we've decoded, we've allowed, instead of having their codification, which is in time very particular, we've enabled these two things to work together because of the axiomatic nature of capital, capital, breaks down these flows, it breaks down the codes and allows them to intersect in a way that they would not have before. It, these intersections, these new machines, uh, when we talk about industrial capital, for example, industrial capital wasn't possible in the 1200s. It, it just like, we understand what it is, but if you just went back there, you wouldn't find industrial capital sitting around somewhere. Yeah. Like it's, 
It's not how it worked. Necessarily, we had to get to this point. Uh, I, I have not talked about Mao at all. I don't think they talk about Mao at all. Um, I have not mentioned it. If I did, it's accidental. I may have said Mouse. Yeah, you said uh, Mouse, Marcel Mouse. You're talking about the... Yeah, Marcel yeah. Mouse, uh, who's not Mao. Uh, not Although yet. that would have been cool. Although you might, you might appreciate this. I have actually... I don't know what year is this even from. This is from... Uh, this edition's from 1972. It's in really good condition for 1972. I've got a hardcover of... Mouse's general theory of magic. Oh, shit. Oh, yeah. I like that. I like that, too. I haven't gotten into it yet. Um, uh, I love Mouse. Uh, uh, Godelia has been my thing because um, I, I read a little bit. Every time we do one of these readings, I find more books that I need to read. Um, and this chapter is really focused specifically on Levi Strauss, Strauss but through Godelia, uh, who was one of his students, and also sort of upturned him and did a lot of work against him. So uh, it's really, really amazing. Is that, um, the, is that the co-author was written out of some of his stuff or? No. Who I mean, was, he's like, uh, it's like Gaudery to Lacan, although I think they were more friendly. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a big uh, uh, Levi Strauss guy myself. Um, Oh, you were talking about you were talking about Levi Strauss. I was talking about Mouse. Um, because there's a there's I just remember there was a line in here, um, in uh, uh, Pensee Sauvage, um, where he he I think he actually quotes from uh, Mouse's book on magic, which is why I got it. And he noted that in later editions, like the co there was a co-author. It was written by two people, and he just just wasn't referenced at a certain point anywhere. It just kind of disappeared mm. from it. Yeah. Well. To get back to it, yes. the, the point here is that we're in this really weird place where, and when they use the term deterritorialization, again, think about these things in that way, that they're being removed from the territories they're in. There's no lines, no fences between them, that yeah. the spaces are, are shattering. The, the way that these things sort of have broken down, it's no longer that it's codification. It's now this odd way that capital returns them. And so because of this, they say like, uh, the, uh, capitalism has haunted all forms, but it haunts them as their nightmares, the dread that they feel old societies. And you can see it in the way that societies acted. Uh, it's the flow that can't be codified a flow that would elude their codes. Um, and then they say, then again, if we say capitalism determines the conditions and the possibility of a universal history, because they don't want to say that, they go, this is true only insofar as capitalism has to deal with its own limits. Capitalism is constantly breaking its own limits. This is core Marx shit. Again, capitalism is capable of uh, self-critique that necessarily finds the limit and then breaks the limit down. Uh, this is the counteraction of the tendency that they refer to inside of the text here. Um, the as they say, they, they quote Gundrys and again, Godelier, Maurice Godelier, go read him. Um, the West's line of development, far from being universal because it will recur everywhere, appears universal because it recurs nowhere else. It is typical, therefore, because in its singular progress, it has obtained a universal result. It has furnished a practical base, an industrial economy, and a theoretical conception, socialism that permit it to leave behind and to cause all other societies to leave behind the most ancient and the most recent forms of exploitation of man by man. The authentic universality of the West line of development lies therefore in its singularity, in its difference, not in its resemblance to the other lines of evolution. Godelier is fucking great. That's Godelier, uh, his notes on Gundris, which is if you want somehow to make Gundris longer, <laughs> pick up Godelier's version where he's got a fuck ton of notes in it because that's what you want is you really want Gundry's but you why take the abridged version right what uh what who publishes that is that just uh uh it's Godelier's comments on Marx he's got a bunch of books on Marx and and other things Godelier has a bunch of shit um I have uh right here on my desk uh Perspective in Marxist Anthropologies, and it's fantastic. Uh, talking about what tribe means and how it works within the commodity productions and understanding how salt was made. 
in these periods, it's kind of awesome. It's it's fascinating to read this shit. Tossing that on the wish list. Um, okay, so so let let me put this into my into my sm smooth smoother feminine brain. Yeah, uh, language. Um, so the the code sort of standing in for a kind of like uh, legible, but but not. Society, when we talk about codes, yeah, yeah, yeah. like even today we talk about codes um, and you hear it a lot of slang when people say like, oh, they're coded gay, they're coded trans, they're coded black, they're yeah. coding this. That thing, that that yeah. is is kind of taking this old anthropological terms where we're like, hey, uh, actually uh, in old tribes, the, the social codes that are written, that are hardline, that are particular, they're not fluid. They yeah, don't yeah. move around. That coding was because when desire exists, when people enter into the world, a newborn baby, born, wanting to do a bunch of stuff, and you can see, again, go back to tribes, you can see they let kids do a whole bunch of things. They have some rules. Don't go there. Don't go here uh, because there are monsters there. Don't leave the tribe. Don't burn yourself. Don't, don't touch this weapon. Things like that. They're very immediate, but they're kids being kids, kind of, until a certain age where they carve into their body. They tell them they're a hunter. They're a... a going to be married off because they're a, a woman uh they're going to be marrying someone else they're a chief they're a whatever they put them in their places and they carve into their bodies they are coded x the the codes of things become literalized specific hardcore like super hardcore uh not like we have now where yeah. things are kind of uh loosey-goosey we got a loosey-goosey thing where we have you know not laws in the way that they had once upon a time where we said, uh, you know, don't go in the forest because you'll be eaten. Now it's don't go in the forest because it's trespassing. Fuck is that? Well, yeah. that's, that's the difference. We have axiomatics versus codification. And that change is, as they're talking about it here, the biggest thing that affects is how desire instantiates itself. Instead of desire being sort of tamped down by hardline codes, you don't fucking do that because we'll all die. Eat yeah, shit. Yeah. Fuck you. Like this really hardcore. It's like, no, you don't do that because that'd be just bad, man. And then we'll yeah. have to punish you. And like this other bad stuff will happen. And then maybe, I don't know, maybe don't walk on the grass. I've walked on the grass. It doesn't, does it sometimes? And if the police decide to, yeah. it's one of those like, yeah, maybe. Well, you can, you can have like a sustained sort of like cultural trope of violating that. That is also not transgressive for that reason. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and again, we're talking about, um, well, this is the beginning, the first half. We're going to be talking about the second half in a bit, actually maybe the next paragraph, because this is when we're talking about desire and how the social world gets built, we're talking about desire entering into the social world. And again, Marx 101, the reason cities look like they do or industries look like they do or towns look like they do is because of the material conditions of them. It's not just purely the material conditions of is it wealthy or not, but uh, towns in China built around rice paddies and hills have a very different type of human being and social structure than tribes in Africa who are built around hunting and running versus tribes in uh, Scandinavia who are built around fishing versus tribes in northern Canada who, who are built around, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't even know what the Inuit Same. eat these days. Like, there's... Depression. There's a there's a ton the of fair enough, but but it, like all of those lives, all of those existences are carved out because of their material realities. But it isn't just the world, and it's not just the people, and the codification that works between both of those things. This is the question: is what begins to fall back? Because it's not just one direction. It's not just desire going from me out into the world, and then maybe it reflects back. It's all part of the same process. It's all part of the same thing. It's all instantiated at the same time. So when we talk about, and we will in a moment, talk about the earth, they mean this in the sort of mother earth, but not quite way, where we talk about the understanding of like when people had a tribe, when people lived in these like old sort of uh, narco communist communes back way back in the day, uh, and we still find uncontacted tribes and some tribes that still live like this. The world that they live in, the earth provides all. 
they work in the skin of the earth. They mark on the earth the same way they mark on their bodies, the way that we like the way that these things operate is different than it is now. We don't operate in the earth these days. We may cut things and, you know, uh, excavate. We may do, we may mine. It's not the same relationship. It's not the same setup. It's not the same thing. Well, like I, th I think here when it talks about the, um, uh, the, the, they feel they feel a flow that would elude their codes, um, and and maybe you can tell me if I'm if I'm not following along. But it sort of brings to mind like a situation that's the subject of like a lot of uh, like really depressing like Russian movies where there will be like uh, a, a a robust sort of like village culture, and then over over the span of three hours, just people will disappear. They've gone to the city. They've gone to war. They've gone to da 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 da, da and eventually it's just kind of an emptying out. And the, the sense you get is of there is a, a robust structure here that is being bled dry from something that the film is not really capable of getting a firm grasp on. Not something. far from that. Uh, when they use the term territorialization or deterritorialization, they're very particularly using an old anthropological term. The idea being that when a tribe has its territory and they're uncontacted, Let's say any of us, we didn't have the rest of the world. Uh, let's say Columbus coming to America or, or wherever the fuck anyone landed with a big ass ship, the tribes would show up. They, that would destroy their understanding of everything because these, this thing came across the, there's more over there. There's, there's more. This was the edge of our world. We, we can't really go for even, even, uh, Pol Polynesian, uh, and uh, Pacific Islanders who really traveled extraordinary distances, the way that territorialization works is they have an edge. There's an edge to things. Mm -hmm. Now, they may push that. They may break that a little bit, but if they are only deterritorialized when it's all shattered, and it gets shattered when, for example, you learn that there's a whole Earth. Uh, Earth and anyone alive today, we would be deterritorialized if, for example, aliens showed up. That would do it for us pretty well. It's the same kind of thing like, oh, fuck. Like, wait, there's more? Yeah, there's actually a billion planets with life forms on it we're aware of. Wait, what? Like, just that moment where our world is expanded, we get deterritorialized and re-territorialized. The territory is our understanding, our grounding, the grounding of our knowledge, if that I, makes sense. Well, I wonder, though, if there's kind of like... And just going back to the other point where it's like the, the, the decoding has sort of allowed us to reflect on this. I wonder if we've kind of reached already sort of an ultimate point in that regard. Because we've already basically well, simulated capitalism, over a million. Capitalism, capitalism completely dismantles codes. Yeah. That's how it works from the beginning. And that's why it continues to. Not, there's no code that's not sort of receptive to it. We have some pushes, but yeah. they're not the same thing. We don't have... Um, if your daughter doesn't keep her virginity and isn't married off right, your whole family's not going to die. Like that, but that, that is the case when a different time when you had, you know, it's four or five people, maybe you have a tribe of 20 or 30 and you want to expand, you want to change the alliances that you exist in and you can't produce enough people and you need to, an alliance does that. You need an alliance or all of you die. Like it's a different mentality and state almost entirely. Versus now where it's like, oh, we, we, we want you to do these things. Why? Well, it's because it's the way things have been done. Very different, very different thing. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a good analogy too. Um, and there, there is a, I, I think also you, you were talking about sort of the, the imminence of the sort of threat that kind of grounds it and kind of like mm -hmm. solidifies these. Um, even when we, we look at, uh, like, for example, you're talking about, like, the, if, you're, if your daughter loses her virginity before marriage or whatever, she's not going to die. Um, but what about the, what about the slow death of Western civilization? Again, the yeah. reason that these rules were instantiated for tribes, once upon a time... The tribes not going to die, yeah. The codification is for the survival of all. Yeah. So if you betray all, you... Again, we go to the... My favorite example is the hunter, who, if the hunter goes out and hunts and he decides not to bring his food back, and he cooks it there, and he eats it there. Yeah. They'll kill him because that's putting everyone at risk. Like, it's a different space. It's a completely different thing versus now where it's like, oh, the hunter didn't bring it back. He killed and ate it. Oh, what a dick. Like, that's a yeah. different thing.
Well, I like um, I I like that that point of clarification you made before that, um, because it, at least at a formal level, like the the argument that uh, the losing virginity before marriage thing will contribute to the slow decline of Western civilization, sort of takes on that same form. It is the but same it's, thing. It's a it's a bullshit like non imminent. Hey, we yeah. I need we need to marry these people because. Uh, you know they're the tr they the they they have people they can be doing work. We need to join forces, and you are the way we're allying that, and you, so you have to get married this way. Now, this hasn't been the case for hundreds of years for most of the people on the planet, um, and certainly isn't really the case almost anywhere uh, today. But it was the case for a long time, and and again, this changes based on a lot of different things because the way it worked underneath kings or dictatorships is a different completely different thing than how it worked with odd tribes even though they may have had a tribe leader or the head of a tribe uh, indigenous americans for example they had chiefs but I, I you don't call them dictators for a reason their social structure wasn't no. based around that person giving edicts and being in control and the whims of the chief which it may be now but it was not that way there was a, a judgment layer to the chief thing, but most of the rules were there because of the needs of the tribe. And they, things were coded based on the codification needs of the tribe. And this is what you tend to find when you go back through all these old anthropological studies. And it's one of the reasons like they cite throughout a lot of this, they cite a lot of mouse, but a lot of Strauss, because this is very basic anthropological shit we've learned. And they start breaking it down differently, granted, very differently. Uh, than Strauss did, but this is stuff we kind of know. This is uh, a fantastic sort of current anthropologist who does this. Uh, he wrote a book. Uh, it's uh, the uh, Edward de Viveros uh, Castro. Um, God damn it! Um, I can't remember his name. His book title is Cannibal Metaphysics, and it's a phenomenal book on how we sort of need to rethink how we consider tribes and talk of it. Um, fantastic book. Um, uh, let's see here. This is Eduardo Viveros de Castro. Yeah. God, I'm fuck. I always fuck up foreign names. I'm terrible. I'm an American. That's a cool one. That's a cool one too. You should be ashamed of that. It's a fucking super cool name. Oh, and I have a friend who almost worked for him. Like, I, these are small circles that these people live in. I'm, I'm an, I'm an asshole. So, but, um, again, the, thinking about these things and how they sort of, uh, how they operate, how we operate, what we consider. It's important that we don't, um, and it's a thing, a way I like to phrase it, the important thing as they're trying to get through this is that we don't put ourselves in the heads of the people we're trying to analyze, that we actually look at what they were like and the realities of the production of their reality that made them the way they are. What is the material reality at every level, including psychologically? And that's the next sort of bit. It's a little bit longer, so we'll take it like a little bit by little bit. Yeah. Um, uh, but again, so they start with the earth as I'm talking about it. Again, think of the earth not as, um, this is not like Gaia goddess thing, but the earth, when you have a tribe, think of just being in a place and what it meant and how the earth became everything for you. It's where you planted, it's where you dug, it's where you buried your dead or your dead decomposed. It's the, the walls based on the mountains that kept others away or you safe, like what the earth was and what it means. The earth is the primitive savage unity of desire and production for the earth is not merely the multiple and divided object of labor. It is also the unique indivisible entity, the full body that falls back on the forces of production and appropriates them for its own as the natural or divine precondition. This is when I said that you kind of like the capitalist falls back on and claims yeah. labor for itself. The earth does the same thing. It, it tribes worship the earth for a reason. The earth, uh, boy, the earth did all of this, gave us this bounty, gave us, it's a good thing that we had the weather we did. The earth and the world gave it, like, earth gave us this. The earth falls back on. Well, the ground can be the productive element and the result of appropriation. The earth, that's a capital E, is the great unengendered stasis, the element superior to production that conditions the common appropriation and utilization of the ground. 
it is the surface on which the whole process of production is inscribed, on which the forces and means of labor are recorded and the agents and the products distributed. They do not mean this metaphorically. This is not poetry. This right. is a literal statement. When you look at a part of the earth, it's still to this day, really too, but much more, much more back in the day, literally you can see all of these things. It's like, oh, that's where, uh, just to go, the whole process of production described on the forces and means of labor are recorded. Here's where people live. Here's where they walk. Here's where they work. Here's what they do. It's all in the earth and on the earth. The agents and the products distributed, forces and means of labor are recorded. Everything well, happens the, on the earth. That's the whole idea of the Anthropocene is like there's, it's, it's just a totalization of that. Yep. Yeah. And it's important to remember again, that in the earth, these things happen again. It's materialist. It's a materialist history. They're going deep marks, deep marks, deep marks. That's M A R X by the way. <laughs> hey, I don't know. People <laughs> don't know who that is anymore. Um, it appears here as the quasi cause of production, as we talked about earlier, and the object of desire. It's on the earth that desire becomes bound to its own repression. That we enter a really weird place, desire does. Desire bound to its own repression. There is a need in these tribes for desire to be codified. Desire wants to be controlled in the earth because the earth has very particularized immediate limits. Uh, if a person didn't think about any of the ways that the world was around them, they'd be dead. So desire has got a self-interested sort of reality to respond to the world, pushing back on it. The world does, the world pushes back. So it's important that it sort of becomes this moment. It's on the earth that desire becomes bound to its own repression. The territorial machine, this is the first socius, the territorial machine, this is the earth, the savage, all of this, is the first form of socius, the machine of primitive inscription, the mega machine, or we talked about earlier, the meta machine that covers a social field. It's not to be confused with technical machines. There's a big deal. This is not, oh, look, it's the agrarian society, <laughs> like whatever. Yeah. There's not that. This is not about the technicalities of it or how the machines were built or literal machines. It is the machinery of production of the whole society, right? Following? Uh, I think so. So we'll pause here. It's a good place. To yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so when we're talking about it covers a social field. Um, yes, I, I'm well, it falls back on. Yeah, that, that's what I'm taking to be the actual function of the machine itself is the covering of the social field or through the generating yes. of it as a field. Okay. But the, the mega machine, the meta yeah. of the social field, it covers it. It here's how things work. Like, boop. Why? Well, this is because this is how it goes and it's particular. And there's very specific reasons. We have a earth that responds to us very directly. Don't fall off this cliff. If you don't have food in this time, you'll die. Uh, there's a lot of very specific things the way the earth treats us. Um, and so as such, we've got rules that we pass down, but they're rules for good reason. Do this or we all die, right? It's a yeah. little different than, uh, hey, make sure you eat all your vegetables so you'll grow up healthy. Uh, I mean, we kind of know that's not really true. You need to, like, there's a lot of other things. <laughs> like, there's a lot of shit that goes into that. And it doesn't give us, I don't know about you. It didn't give me a healthy relationship with food. Um, no, no. Um, so it's a lot of those things where it's like, eh, not so much anymore, but the rules were hard it was needed. And we have all these things. It, the simplest in its simplest so-called manual forms, the technical machine already implies an acting, a transmitting or even driving element that is non-human that extends man's strength and allows for a certain disengagement from it. This is the idea of uh, man being the cause. Yeah. Which they don't like, and I don't either. The idea that man made the, oh, no, no. If we have technical machines that it's a technical machine, that means that I'm pushing the socius to be what it is. I'm push, pulling a lever, you're pulling a lever, all of us are pulling levers that make the socius. It's bullshit. Yeah. It's a big deal. They're being very, very specific here. 
uh, very, very, um, uh, the social machine in contrast has men for its parts, even if we view them with their machines and integrate them, internalize them in an institutional model at every stage of action, transmission and motricity. It, it's the whole thing, the smash together, all of it. And the shape that it gives us. This is why I like using the term, the meta of the video games. It's not about what items your character has. It's not about how fast you play or anything. The meta is the meta. It lays on top of all of that. And it does, it, the parts are the people with the, the mice and the keyboards and the parts of the games. It's the whole thing. Let's, uh, let's keep going here because I, I think, I think I know where, where this is going and I, I want to like see the rest Excellent. of this. The social mean, the social machine in contrast, uh, sorry, blah, 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 blah. Hence. Hence, the social machine fashions a memory without which there would be no synergy of man and his technical machines. The latter do not in fact contain the conditions for the reproduction of their process. They point to social machines that condition and organize them, but also limit and inhibit their development. It will be necessary to await capitalism to find a semi-autonomous organization of technical production that tends to appropriate memory and reproduction, thereby modifies the forms of the exploitation of man. But as a matter of fact, this organization presupposes a dismantling of the great social machines that precede it. Uh, the, the latter do not in fact contain the conditions for the reproduction of their process. The technical machines do not reproduce their own process. They right. have a beginning and end. There's a cause effect done straight through. Uh, a car manufacturer doesn't make the situation for cars to be manufactured. It builds goddamn cars. This is again, core marks. Uh, uh, business doesn't make jobs. Yeah. Jobs uh, are made by people needing work. Uh, but specifically people needing the output of the labor, which creates the demand, which creates the push for the labor, which creates people who the jobs for people to make it. So the actual people at the end who are then therefore also employed are the people who cause their own employment. Almost it's kind of an amazing thing. Capitalism did. Now we say the capitalists are the job creators. It's not true. Uh, but here we've got to be very particular. We've got to talk about this, the, the latter. These don't contain the conditions. These instead, these point to, these technical machines point to social machines that condition and organize them, but also limit and inhibit their development. The, the social machines, the, the socius of the multiple socii, this, the way the meta is set up economically, the way these things are built, the demand, how these things are put together. We have, we have all these machines, they point at and they kind of direct us towards understanding, oh, this, this machine is actually saying why this thing needs to be here and where they're set up, but they don't create themselves. They point at, they produce that sort of secondary thing. I um, think what's, what's kind of interesting is that uh, Thomas Hobbes seems to do exactly that, but he does it walking backwards. So he has society being comprised, the, the social machine being comprised mm -hmm. of people, but he's, he's got a trick to it. Um, the people are composed of their machines. And so he's able to pull off the exact same thing while it takes sort of the, the form of the critique that's being made here, but he's actually doing the exact opposite. Um, well, I, I'm going to actually just jump to a part of the next paragraph because it doesn't matter if we read it in order. We do need to wrap up shortly because I have a guest tomorrow I need to prep because I want well, that's, much time. that's fantastic. We're going to do 20 minutes. Okay, well, we can also continue. 15. We can also continue. I want to continue this one. Because it's, I just, the next beginning is... This will close out the point and we Perfect. can discuss and be done. Uh, the same machine can be both technical and social, but only when viewed from different perspectives. They give examples. I love this. For example, the clock as technical machine for measuring uniform time does that. And as social machine for reproducing canonic hours and for assuring order in a city. There's a difference. Social machine, technical machine. Yeah. It can be the same. I love the, the use of that, the, the clock. There's or, every city that has a clock face. That is very much what it's intended for. Don't worry, things are orderly here. Don't worry. Uh, um, when Lewis Mumford coins the word mega machine to designate the social machine as collective entity, he is literally correct, although he limits it to barbaric despo despots. It's fair. Uh, to quote him, and this quote is, I'm going to read all the way through. 
if more or less in agreement with Merlot's classic definition, one can consider the machine to be the combination of solid elements, each having its specialized function and operating under human control in order to transmit a movement to perform a task, then the human machine was indeed a true machine. The social machine is literally a machine irrespective of metaphor in as much as right. it exhibits an immobile motor and undertakes a variety of interventions, flows, set aparts, elements detached, portions of tasks performed and distributed. Coding the flows implies all of these operations. This is the social machine's supreme task. In as much as the appropriation of production corresponds to extractions from this chain, resulting in a residual share for each member in a global system of desire and destiny that organizes productions of production, the productions of recording and the productions of consumption. Flows of women and children, flows of herd and seed, sperm flows, flows of shit, menstrual flows, nothing must escape coding. The primitive territorial machine with its immobile motor, the earth is already a social machine, a mega machine, that codes the flows of production, the flows of means of production of producers and consumers. The full body of the goddess earth gathers to itself the cultivatable species, the agricultural implements, and the human organs. That's why I love this book. And I thought this was 100% up your alley. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm really like, I kind, of, I kind of wish we started here in, initially because it's, it's a lot more is... There's a lot more just touchstones for me personally. Do you know which Mumford book that is from? Uh, no. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull that up because I'm. Kind it's of in the footnotes. Up. Give me a second. I think that one's an endnote. Um, That's an endnote. Give me two seconds. I'll tell you. That well, is. Uh, I mean, take a shot. Do you think it's called the first Mega Machine? Yes, it is. That's the title, the first Mega Machine. It looks huh. like it's a piece he wrote in Diogeny. So that's not going to be a thing that's easy to find. Let me see what I can do for you. Gotcha, gotcha. No, he wrote um he wrote a book something something machines. I bet it's in there. Um. Well. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> I doubt it's in English. Though. The myth of the machine. I think. Oh, there we go. Mumford's just about the reality of the mega machine. Um, I think it's. I think in English it's included in the myth of the machine. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, in, in French, it's uh, part of Diogenes issue 55, the first mega machine. Ancient, how he describes how ancient civilizations created, created political and religious systems functioning like machines to control masses and exploit natural resources. Well, I'm reading his um, city in history at the moment. He's got a really interesting way of, uh, of, of defining cities as essentially containers of containers. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, it, it's it's. I'm, I'm I'm. I like I like seeing that name pop up. Good to hear. Yeah. Let's. Uh, he's. I find him fascinating. Um, but I find this section of the book is really great. It's it is a good place to start. It's important <laughs> to understand a lot of the things that came before this, though, because yeah. your the challenge will be in about two chapters. You will be completely fucking lost because. They get into how desire operates and the three syntheses. And unless you've got like a solid background in Deleuze, which I mean, you wouldn't if you haven't read AO. Um, uh, but even without that, like he's got a lot, there's a lot that goes into this and it starts getting really complex, but at its base level, it's uh, at this point, the biggest thing is to stop thinking about uh, that we are, or anyone is in control of the machine. It's one of the things that they don't want us to be thinking about. They want us to be away from this idea of the narrative of a handful of people control it. But the reality is that like the machine is this emergent recording layer yeah. of all of our stuff. And yes, we're born into the world, but it's not like anyone set this in motion. There's no great grand in control person. There's a whole bunch of shit happening, but it's all simultaneous because that's the other side that makes this. And it's why the rest of the book is deeply important before you get to this. When we talk about social machines, desire machines, which are pre-personal, which are the things that make up you and I every moment of every day, social machines are desiring machines. There's no difference. Yeah. They're just desiring machines under determinate conditions. 
So that reality is, it's not that blood or desire is pumping out of all of us into a larger machine. No, it's that desire is pumping and everything's happening. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's a lot. Well, how about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope I explained at least parts of it. It's, this is not an easy book. Um, and so if anyone is coming away questionable, feel free to jump in uh, DGQC, uh, discord.com, DG forward slash DGQC. You can join any time. We do readings every Tuesday for two hours, and then the rest of the week we're answering questions. We have uh, What is Philosophy? I do every Thursday. Um, I think I'm going to do a fun Logic of Sense revisit uh, because, I, you, because of you, actually, and some of the streams you've been doing. I uh, wanted to go back and revisit Logic of Sense. Good uh, timing. I have a, I have a suspicion I got one. I got that for Christmas actually. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, um, but then we have a. I mean, we have a whole bunch of readings coming up. We're we're, we're 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 hot with readings, and we're doing a lot of really fun stuff. So it's kind of super fun that way. What I what I've kind of found is like, and and you were sort of gesturing at this earlier. Um, I don't know if this was like a, a mistake or not, but you you mentioned like if you haven't, you you need to know to lose before you can read this next section of AO. And by the way, if you haven't read AO, you haven't read to lose. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like the, it's like the barista, uh, conditions of, of working in a coffee shop. It's like, we want at least two years of barista experience. That's every single coffee shop that exists. Um, yeah, and, yeah. and, and the reality is like, I'm, I'm slowly becoming someone that people listen to on to lose, which I'm, I still am having trouble even understanding how that's possible, but what um, I what probably, I found what I found yeah. just to cut you off like you uh, you sent me a little literary care packet. I found that um, the more I read stuff sort of surrounding it, the easier it becomes. Just because there is no like this is not entry level material at all. No, it is not. Um, Deleuze is like yeah. I, I used to say make a joke that he's like the Family Guy of philosophy. Like you can't watch an episode of Family Guy and get any jokes without having seen everything that Seth used to watch like early episodes was like everything's a reference or a joke and unless you know it it's not funny and Deleuze is that every, every paragraph is referencing two or three other works that he's he makes sarcastic comments about so he'll like make a critique and a sarcastic comment while referencing a thing without directly referencing it and the only it's insane it's it's insane it's very complex but it's um also one of the reasons the book's so deeply rewarding once you start your path down this idea and understanding how he sees the world, I consider it to be one of the most emancipatory uh, books that there is because it's sidestepping the idea of cause and effect, sidestepping the idea of individualism. It's sidestepping a lot of things that are problematic based on how we are taught to see the world and how we are shown to see the world because of how capitalism works. And instead, if we're able to step back and understand actually how things operate the simultaneous production of myself and you and all of us that it gives us a completely different way to look at things and that's the power of things the the meaning meaning is the power and uh just because people were asking um the deleuze and guattari quarantine collective uh yeah you can i posted a thing that looks like a link that sort of looks right I'll, I'll post a link in the description as well um if this if this becomes a segment soon um, but I'll put, yeah. in the, I'll put in the description of this video too. Um, and you can find that on YouTube and there is a, uh, if you come into my Discord server, uh, you will find your way there pretty quickly. That's fair. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for coming on. Um, we, we should continue this soon. Um, I'm, I'm incapacitated for a couple of days, but uh, we need You're to- You're free to be. We need to continue. Well, I've already taken the week off. I'm tech, I can barely justify that, even though I probably need a lot more. Um, <laughs> We, uh, we'll, we'll continue this soon and we need to do, um, lethal, lethal squad. We've got to do, uh, is it lethal squad? I, I, I'm thinking cruelty squad. I'm mixing the two. Is it lethal company? Lethal company. Or something. Hang on, hang on. Wait, lethal, lethal, lethal company. There we go. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it pop up in our, in the meme compilation. Lethal company. Watch. We need to play. I mean. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to play once. That'd be cool. Yeah. It is. I think we made it. Sunday died, but we made it. So, hey, pretty good. Do we really give a shit that he died? No. No.